Hello and welcome to Linux Lads, episode 113. As usual, I'm Shane and I'm joined by the other three. Say hello. 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 I'm number three. <laughs> so as usual, I'm joined by Connor, Mike and Amleth. You're very welcome along. Hello. So this week we're going to talk uh, a little bit about the typical Linux stereotype person, you know. We don't want to de- delve into, you know, uh, like offending people or stepping on anyone's toes, but we all know that there are stereotypes in this space and uh, how it actually differs from that, like in reality, and how it's n- you're not actually going to meet that typical kind of person all the time. Good thing to talk about before we head off to Ubuntu Summit next week. <laughs> yeah, so you meet all kinds of people there. This this will likely be released after we're, we're there, so, but yeah, mm-hmm. we're, we're off to, uh, uh, next week we're off to Ubuntu Summit. That's true. So I think we can kind of all agree, like we all have this, like there is this sort of perception of the Linux nerd outside of our little world of, you know, the gray beard doesn't wash their clothes, just like (laughs) spends all their time indoors, you know, has some sort of skin problem. (laughs) Has never heard of deodorant. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It's like, obviously, we know from being in this world that nothing could be further from the truth. You get all kinds of different people. Um, So Mike, since this was your idea to talk about, I'm going to go to you first. What do you think about this? So it's interesting. It didn't come from this direction for me. I am, I'm, I'm scrolling through my Mastodon feed, which I do fairly often, and I see two trends. There are two things kept coming up, two motifs. We don't like AI, artificial intelligence, or the large language models, these kind of things. And we don't like uh, people taking our data. In absolute, right, at all. And I have to say, most of my feet are Linux geeks. And that got me thinking, if people, like, if, if, if there was a stereotype of a Linux geek, it would definitely be somebody who's very privacy conscious to the point of uh, data must not be given to anyone, and who probably doesn't like AI in its current form because it's uh, not necessarily commercial, but... Uh, you know, uh, the, the, because it's unreliable and it's a big business buzzword and it's a bit like the blockchain of 2023, you know, it's everywhere and it doesn't, and nobody really, it, it, it's, it's an undefined mess. And there's a lot of mm. buzz from, uh, from a lot of people who are not necessarily very trustworthy and there's a lot of hype around it as well. And I think maybe that for me, that stereotype of a Linux geek has moved from that bearded guy in a dark basement uh, who hasn't washed in a week and just types uh, commands into the command line? It has moved to a person who's very more, more, more like a privacy kind of nerd and don't take my data kind of a person. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking how I actually compare to this stereotype. So the first one that you mentioned, obviously, I wash, I wash my clothes, I don't have serious skin issue. Somehow in my life, I even mani- mani- managed to get married. So yeah, you know, on uh, on the but then again, I'm no longer 17, right? So uh, I guess uh, I guess that kind of stereotype obviously doesn't apply to me or anybody in this conversation. And I don't think it applies to anybody I know. But I was comparing my ideas to the stereotype of that of the you know the, the 2023 Linux geek, I think. And I have to say, uh, I like large language models as an idea. I think it should be developed. And as for the data part, well. We, I, I, I like data, I like privacy, but I also like a functioning and efficient health system. So, and I think that if there is, uh, if, if, if society, so, but, hmm, again, I think it would be beneficial for society if we maybe let go a little of uh, that bias, to, not bias, of, of the grasp on the data and on our privacy, and just maybe let not commercial entities, not businesses, but like, and this is going to come out terribly, but let the government in on some data because they could do with something. Something. <gasps> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> and I'm not talking, I'm not necessarily talking about the cops, right? But I'm talking about, uh, well, the health system is one thing. We could definitely, that could definitely do with more data. I would actually like to be warned if, if I'm in my 50s or when I'm in my 50s, and there is a large possibility that a heart attack, heart attack is coming, and it could be that used by some machine learning bot from a lot of data that I would submit over the years. I'm all for it. I want that to happen. I'd rather it happened 
under government supervision than me giving all my data to Apple. And yeah, so that's one. So so essentially what you're describing is in your 50s, you're going to have uh, contact lenses that do automatic, uh, augmented reality. And th- in this future technology, you're going to have a little clippy character pop up in your in your bottom left and go, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I see you're about to drink another pint. Do you really want to do that? Well, yeah, so there's a problem, right? Uh, actually, I see you're having a heart attack. Can I help you with that? <laughs> would, you, would, you like, would you like me to call you a mortician? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> would you like to donate your organs to science? Um, <laughs> but serious, I think, you know, it doesn't have to be clippy, but it should be helpful. So I was thinking, well, I'm probably not, uh, I like Linux, but I'm probably not the... I'm not just stereotypical Linux nerd because you know there are there are things that I would like the society to develop and they probably will need a bit of a chunk of our privacy and I also think that maybe what society needs more than privacy is forgiveness because a lot of privacy happens because we don't want others to judge us uh which we're going to get so much crap from me even <sighs> saying this but uh I think people should just chill and not not care about other people's business and then we can maybe just let the data i do have to say i do sort of see where you're coming from yes i look at my mastodon pro my mastodon feed and obviously no disrespect intended to any of those people i love mastodon and i think it's full of great people and i i I like the look of everyone on my on my uh feed anyway so i don't i don't know what's happening in their private life maybe they kick puppies for a living i don't know but (laughs) i hope not they seem like good people on the surface but yeah, I, I do get with you me- what you mean. There's a lot of, and this this could easily stray into like, uh, you know, alt right, bloody like, uh, like contrarian territory here. I'm aware, but I do agree that the, a lot of people are very very zealous about certain issues, and it almost excludes good being done with that technology or concept or whatever it may be. Um, and it's it sort of it's sort of just a com- the shutters go down. It's like, oh, it's AI. Fuck that. I don't want anything to do with that. Um, or if it's uh, anything to do with telemetry or harvesting data of any description, people are like immediately, nope, I don't want I want nothing to do with it. You know, I and literally uh, about to so I do. That. Exactly. And I do kind of agree with you. I mean, the right tool for the right job. And I do agree that. AI, um, I'm, I'm going to be a bit like fail them off late night in the next year. I think the term AI is bloody stupid and I wish people would stop using it because it's not artificial intelligence. That's not what that, that's, that's a bullshit marketing term. But, you know, machine learning, you know, linear algebra, if, if else statements, you know, all that's a bit harder to say. But um, I do agree that it's, it's a cool technology. I mean, the ability to ask natural language questions and get a, a, a concise, like comprehensive response is useful i don't think anyone could deny that so that's just my two cents on it yeah i mean i think the older you get the more you moderate i think in terms of your opinions i and that's definitely me like i would have been the guy when i was younger i wanted to self-host all the things and i was like no get away from any fang company like uh i would be like no get the hell away from me i don't want your your stinky data i don't want your stinky software (laughs) so but i've kind of moderated quite a lot as i've gotten older and just just sort of gotten a lot more pragmatic about it anyway connor when i first thought of this topic uh i would say and i've had this interaction with uh when i've been in work as well uh like people would kind of hear through the grapevine um not that i broadcast it that much but they say that i like they'll be asking oh what did you get up at the weekend and i say oh i had a linux meetup oh really cool what how, what's that about so they, they'd have those conversations and they were like connor's into linux then all of a sudden somebody would come up to me with a really technical like command line question i'm like just because i'm into linux doesn't mean that i'm freaking a command line wizard <laughs> uh, so that's one stereotype that i, I have come across before for for me uh, and anyone who has interacted with me and you guys will attest to this as well. I spend a lot of my time in uh, the graphical user interface. I I do some things on the command line, but it wouldn't be something that I'd use regularly. I prefer to interact with things using the graphical user interface. So I think a stereotype out there, as Mike alluded to, is uh, that anybody who's into Linux pretty much just lives inside the command line and the uh, the graphical interface is in- inconsequential. Of course, there will be people out there that that's how they choose to interact with their computer, but I'm not one of them. So <laughs> I'm bucking the stereotype in that regard. 
Amelith, what's your take on that? I probably fit the stereotype more than you guys do. <laughs> I have a beard. I think so. I, I think we can yeah. agree on that. Yes. I have a beard, glasses. I'm a big guy. I don't stay in the house all day, but I work from home, so that means I stay at home while I'm working. I do tend to prefer terminals to graphical interfaces, but at the same time, I pay for Netflix. I used to think I wanted to self-host everything under the sun, but just last week I found this piece of software called TimeTagger, which is open source, self-hosted. It's for like a timesheet kind of thing, so you can track for yourself how much time you spend on different things. Instead of self-hosting it and going through that mess, I just paid for it. It's very reasonably priced. And also, as Shane was saying, I have mellowed out over the years. I used to be a very hardcore text editor all the way, but right now I have the, a bunch of the JetBrains IDEs installed and I'm using them, like Goland, RubyMine, Sea Lion, and, and a few others, because they require less tinkering. I want to get stuff done, not spend hours fiddling with Emacs Lisp to fix Doom Emacs when it breaks. Welcome to the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> for, for the benefit of our listeners, Mike's wearing a hoodie, and he put the hood up when saying that. <laughs> yeah, that was a quality Emperor Palpatine impression. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, let the hate flow through you. Um, good, so, good, good. <laughs> something, something, Linux. <laughs> <laughs> something, something complete. Anyway, that's an inconsequential. So on this topic, uh, it ties nicely into a project that I've been meaning to mention on the podcast for like several episodes now. And this actually ties in really nicely with this topic. But like Connor said, he, he's very much happy in a GUI and doesn't visit the command line too often. I'm the exact same. I, I tend to avoid the nitty gritty a lot of the time. Um, but I actually don't interact with uh, computers that much anymore. You know, I actually use I use Linux on my main PC in that. But I don't distro hop as much. I don't tinker with things as half as much as I used to, like if at all these days. Like during, I kind of have a weird rotation. Like during the summer, I tend to just, you know, go out with friends and do social things and not stay inside that much and, you know, try to go outdoors. And I, I love the outdoors. I love hiking and, and bouldering and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm kind of an active enough person, like uh, in my personal life. I like sitting around on a chair all day, just like it's like nails on a chalkboard to me. I kind of have to move. So it's kind of in the dark, colder winters is when I tend to sit down at a computer and do more techie stuff. Um, and uh, it's kind of Christmas is the time when I play, I play video games. I play, <laughs> like I, I play games for like two weeks a year and that's during Christmas when I'm off work. So that's, that's kind of me. I come at Linux from a different, I come at it more from an ideological point of view rather than a technical point of view. I just think that. And, and I think with those kind of people that Mike was describing earlier on on Mastodon, I think the, the kind of the through line there, what they're really opposed to is not any of these actual things they're talking about. I think at the core of it, what they're opposed to is big, powerful entities taking advantage of the technology. I don't think they're opposed to the technology itself. I think they're opposed to the damage it can do if it's misused by a bad actor of some description. Um, and I think that's where that all comes from. I think if there was complete trust in the people using the technology, there wouldn't be an, an issue there. It would be like, that's a cool technology. We totally trust you to use that responsibly. Um, but that's uh, not, not usually the case, let's face it. But yeah, to get to the project I, I mentioned earlier, um, this is a great example of a project that uses open source, but for a completely different reason, because a lot of the open source projects we talk about on this podcast tend to be for people doing things on a computer to make their lives easier, you know, um, to make make doing a technical thing easier, be that programming or sysadmin, things like that. Um, but I discovered a great uh, piece of software called Community Platform. It's on GitHub. We'll link it. But it's from a, a, a non-profit, a not-for-profit called One Army. So you might have heard of One Army before. Um, they have a bunch of different initiatives that they that they have under their umbrella. One is called Precious Plastic, which people might have heard of, where they basically just like it's it's like a global community where they set up um, workshops where you can recycle bits of old plastic into new things, and they they have a whole like resource online 
where you can see the different types of plastic, what, what different types of containers you can find plastic in and what to do with it, how to cut it up and melt it down and reform it into other things and all the different tools you need, stuff like that. They've also got, uh, I'm just looking at their website, they've got Fixing Fashion. So it's basically um, an initiative to show people how to uh, repair their own clothing um, so they don't have to, because fast fashion is one of the biggest contributors to um, climate change and waste. Um, they have fixing fashion. So yeah, teach you how to sew and stuff like that and repair your clothes and, you know, upcycle your clothes. Um, they've got Story Hopper, which is like, uh, which is more of an educational kind of initiative initiative. Uh, to make complex kind of topics that people struggle to understand a bit more digestible. Uh, And then there's like phone blocks, which is like an initiative to uh, tackle e-waste in the mobile phone space, essentially. Um, But the really cool one um, that I found out about all this through was Project Camp, which is a YouTube channel. And it's essentially like they bought a plot of land in Portugal for cheap, and they're using it as basically a laboratory to, to figure out how to just how to live sustainably, how to make a sustainable society that reuses things and doesn't waste anything and, you know, lives in a more responsible kind of ethical way. Uh, You know, it's not necessarily about climate change, but it's a lot of it's to do with climate change. Um, (laughs) So um, I discovered that they have a software platform, which is completely open source called Community Platform. So this is what they base, they use for all their different projects and initiatives. And uh, it's like a purpose-built CRM, I guess. No, not CRM. The, there's another term I'm looking for. CMS? CMS. That's the one. But more geared towards like sharing what they've learned. And they have like a, a site and stuff where they have uh, articles detailing, like basically documenting all the different things they've done, like like a solar energy system that they installed and how to like convert shipping containers into different types of workspace, blah, blah, blah. You know, all, all sorts of like nifty stuff like that. And uh, but they invented they came up with their own open source software and stuck it on GitHub and everything. And this is something you can just download and put on your server and use it if you want. Um, and it's really it's really cool. And it's got tons and tons of contributors like uh, and it's like it seems quite robust. I've never actually tried it myself. Like I haven't looked into how to install it or anything. I just haven't even looked into that. But that that's kind of another aspect to the open source privacy Linuxy world that we're all talking about here. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be anything to do with computing or computers. It's just open source can be quite useful to a lot of different people uh, for different reasons. And this is a perfect example, I think, anyway. I will link all of those uh, links in the show notes as well, so everyone can check those out. And I thoroughly encourage anyone who's uh, curious about sustainable living or sustainable uh, society to check out that Project Camp YouTube channel. It's really interesting, and it's definitely my jam, because <laughs> it's kind of an overlap between technical, you know, interesting stuff with just, like, getting your hands dirty and building something, you know, um, which I really love. I love to work with my hands, so uh, check it out. It does sound very interesting, indeed. I'm looking at the Phone Blocks page, and this is really interesting. They're they're wanting to create a modular phone that you can upgrade and repair, kind of like the Fairphone. But then it says Google joined in and took a serious attempt at this same kind of thing with Project Aura, but then they killed mm. it a few years later. Ah, uh, yeah, I was aware of uh, Project yeah. Aura. I think we've mentioned it on the podcast before. I don't think I'd ever heard of it. It was a thing a few years back. They thought that they would make a modular phone. I don't know why they nick why they candid possibly it was not worth it for them yeah. i saw a youtube video on a pretty advanced uh, prototype and it was a um, it was a metal frame not just around the outside but like in um in order for the modules to be able to attach to in order to give the rigidity sort of the uh, like interchangeable modules sort of like how um, Framework is doing with their their laptops where you can swap in and out modules I uh, for people who are uninitiated we could probably have a, a photo of it in the show notes but um, and there was kind of it was the it was the back modules were uh, were all colourful so it was essentially the back of the phone you could swap out modules um i don't know if they had a specific designated slot it's not like that you say oh like typically the camera module is towards the top of the phone i want to swap that out and put it somewhere else because i'm 
quirky and I kind of want to move things around or what individual individualize your phone like that. I don't know if it quite had the that functionality, but yeah, it was it was quite interesting. But sadly, Google killed it. And I think if I remember remember correctly, that so Google owned Motorola at the time, and I think it was Motorola's hardware division was was kind of lending a lot of expertise towards Project Era. It always comes back to phones, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> On this podcast, anyway. You said something interesting there about the like that the people would be okay with all the technology if only whoever whoever has got control over it could have been trusted. Now, I don't think you can you can hundred percent trust any entity. Like, yeah, you can trust you can trust your loved ones, but you cannot trust a organization because you know just by its nature but that's an that to me is an argument to okay then uh let's all petition the the government to take uh to take uh steps so that there are checks and balances on this and also and this is would be more important to me like it should actually be the bloody government who does the biggest research on this they you know like they did with the moon like they did with the uh moon landing and the whole 1960 space program uh, preferably without uh, without there being like the Democles sort of uh, of a third world war hanging over them, but like there is so much cool technology, and the only reason why it's in the grabby hands of uh, of certain enterprises is that the government hasn't gotten to do it earlier. You know, the government is the governments are in the unique position of having a lot of money. And as long as the politicians com- convince everybody, or at least enough people, they can spend the money literally on moonshots. So we could have had this AI back in the 2000s, possibly, if it if it wasn't left to private enterprises. Anyway, that's just a rent that's really not going anywhere. But I and I think you know I think that people would maybe trust it more if it was uh, if they had it was if it was in the hands of a government that can be replaced you know, uh, by the people. Where there's a will, there's a way is what you're saying, basically. And yeah, I just think we live in very different times where there's a lot of distractions. There's a lot of our our, our people's attention are very divided and it's very difficult. And we get our uh, information and our news and everything from a lot of different sources and a very personalized kind of sources that like match our own ideologies quite closely, things like that. So I think it's hard to get everyone on board with a single grand idea these days it's getting very philosophical there but like i I think that's that's the key difference between like the moon like the apollo program era and now i think back then it was a real like ideological push like from from all the people were like yeah the usa is going to go to the moon and we're going to beat the the soviets you know it was it was a very black and white uh let's let's do this team kind of mentality you know so i think once you get social buy-in that's that's what you're talking about really i think that that ties back into the stereotypes or or why people use linux Um, a lot of it is privacy and control um i would use linux for both of those but in different different ways privacy because it's my data i want to be confident that i know where it's going or at least reasonably confident even if i don't know the exact technical detail of it um any time that i use particularly windows i don't use mac os that often but particularly windows is like no i i don't want candy crush thank you very much and then that kind of eats away at my brain and going well if they're doing installing this that on my computer what else are they installing on my computer or then the the whole trust relationship is completely broken but that's the the, the world that the vast majority um are, are uh living in because of windows market share and uh the vast majority of people don't seem to be that concerned because that is the way their computer has always run as far as they're concerned um and the control aspect of it is it it kind of uh, stems from that, but it it uh, manifests itself in a different way as well. Control with Linux for me is customization. I can pretty much change everything that I I want to. I'm running KD at the moment. I can make KD look however I want. Tomorrow, if I don't want KD anymore, I can wipe it and I can put XFCE or Cinnamon or 
no gnome on it or or a tiling window manager if i i choose to or whatever uh i like the customization and the control that it gives back to me the user it's my computer i i i should have the control over it in those proprietary systems like windows uh they're basically telling you no you 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 don't have access to do that uh we you can only change a limited amount of things and be grateful for it yeah, that is another stereotype of the of the Linux user as the infinite tin- tinkerer. Yet the most popular uh, desktop environment is GNOME, and that's arguably doesn't reflect the stereotype. Because if we were all real tinkerers, then probably we would choose something else. That's not me pissing on GNOME. GNOME is great, but it's not the ultimate tinkerer's environment. No. If you're happy with the defaults, there's nothing wrong with that. There's uh, it's the opportunity or the availability of other options should you uh, want them or not i think what going along with that kind of another reason a lot of people use linux is because they're developers and it's a very pleasant place to set up a development environment because windows doing anything super technical in windows is painful in my experience while on linux the it's all right there in front of you. You can delete your operating system if you like. <laughs> um, but it's that that same kind of mentality that it's your computer. You should be able to do what you like with it. And other operating systems making it difficult for you to do those more advanced things drives people towards Linux, where it's not difficult to do advanced things. But at the same time, you don't have to do those advanced things. So that about wraps it up for this week. Um, next episode, uh, you will be hearing our our tales of our tales of adventure uh, from Riga and Latvia at the Ubuntu Summit. So we're really looking forward to that. That's that's next Thursday. We're heading off to Riga. So yeah, watch this space. We we we're, we're going to try to get some uh, coverage of that event and talk to as many people as possible. So we'll 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 see what we get on the on the weekend. Uh, and uh, Amalith has an announcement about his uh, his project Willow. Yeah, so Mike and I talked about it on episode 108. At the time, it was not open source. It is now open source. And you can get the code by going to earl.run slash willow. That's E-A-R-L dot R-U-N. And it's not, you know, it's not at a 0.0.1 yet. It's more 0.0.1 alpha, but it is usable. You can track software releases with it, and it's got a light and a dark mode, and you can log in, log out, manage users, that kind of stuff. Awesome. So check it out. Um, so that about wraps it up for this week. Um, as usual, you can find all our contact details on linuxlads.com forward slash contact. Uh, we're most active on Telegram and Mastodon. Uh, best places to get in touch with us. You can email us on show at linuxlads.com. Uh, we read every single email, so Give us a shout if you have any uh, feedback. And uh, yeah, we will see you all again in two weeks, hopefully with a lot of great Ubuntu Summit content. And uh, talk to you then. Bye-bye. Bye. Adios. Bye. Okay, that was good silence. I didn't hear a thing, literally. <laughs> okay, so, um, hello, welcome to Linux. Oh, shit, what's the episode number?